Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Kale Zeldin podcast. It's been a while since uh, we fired this up, and I've brought back um, my good friend now, Larry Chap. Dr. Larry Chap, um, you've been a busy guy. What what have you been up to these days? Well, I can't remember the last time we had a show, so let's just. First off, I had oh. COVID, uh, and uh, that uh, it was pretty mild for me. My mm-hmm. wife had it too. It was mm-hmm. pretty mild, lasted about mm-hmm. ten days. It was just kind of for me like a bad sinus sure. infection and a lot of right. fatigue. So that put me down mm-hmm. for a while. Uh, but for, but other than that, I mean, there are some things here on on the, uh, on the Catholic Worker Farm where we're getting ready for winter, moving right. sheep around to different pastures, that kind of thing. But in terms of I mean, I've been blogging a lot, and of course, I'm now I'm I'm writing two books at the same no. time, which I don't yeah. don't recommend. One for Ignatius Press, one for Word so on I, Fire. I have questions about that. I mean, I, I mean, just from a process standpoint, how do you manage that? Well, I'm not managing <laughs> it very well, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, I, I always I always wonder about that. That's exactly uh, yeah yeah yeah. Uh, in in reality, uh, there's. Especially since the two books, one for Ignatius Press, one for Word on Fire, are on sort of similar sort of tracks. It's it's like someone who knows Spanish who then goes to Italy, you know, and is learning Italian, yeah. and there's all these like yeah. Latinate yeah, yeah, cognates between the. So you can't uh, like, oh wait a minute, uh, that's Spanish, not Italian, and uh, it's the same with writing these two books. It's crazy, but you know what? It's it's. It's a great opportunity. I'm enjoying it. I like writing. It's it's given me a, a, a sort of I, what I've discovered about myself is that uh, vocationally, I am no longer part of the scholarly academic right. world, but uh, but I am still yeah. a teacher. Yeah. I mean, even when I was a scholar, I was almost exclusively a teacher of sure. undergraduates and uh, not high flute and graduate mm-hmm. teaching. And uh, I just love teaching yeah. and so returning to writing and blogging and doing these sorts of video casts seems quite mm-hmm. natural to me to finally put my big toe back into that pool yeah I you know as, as you know I'm a I'm a, a high school teacher and you know I'm, I'm, right. I'm blessed you know I, I've, I've got some pretty um, intelligent eager students who are relatively dutiful and uh, up for sort of whatever crazy thing I've got going on in the classroom um, and it's a for me, it's a great opportunity. I, I you know, it's a strange way of of sort of clarifying my sense of meaning and purpose. Uh, I might, you know, groan and 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 uh, complain about having to do class prep and, and all that. But as soon as I get in that classroom and we start talking about whatever yeah. it is we we're talking about, I just I really kind of find myself. It's a it's it's both a a, a, a source of great um, joy and uh, blessing and comfort for me, uh, but it also feels a little bit like a curse. I must admit. So, um, well, great, great. It is. is it is. It's not fun um, <laughs> because you know in class I love them all, but you know when you're when you're grading, it's it's yeah. you know you're I gotta I got I have to love them in a different way, uh, and and truth sort of sneaks in there and requires that you. Um, handle yourself differently uh so anyway yeah i think uh well it's good uh, any just quickly what, what are the what are the two books on uh one for word on fire is on the universal call to holiness which yeah. uh, you know i blog yeah. about a lot uh, bishop Barron loves i, I was that's on right. Bishop we had, Barron's that's show. right we hadn't had know. a chance to talk about that i we i wanted to talk a little bit about that. yeah that was great that was uh, the play let me just say this i, I flew from philly to mm-hmm. santa barbara and let's just say that since covid the airlines have given up any pretense of giving a damn yeah. about their customers. Yeah. Let's just say that air travel has become an yeah. absolute nightmare. But the ex- uh, I love Robert Barron. He and I are, yeah. are friends, and the, the the whole experience with the Word on Fire staff was That's great. Awesome. So that was great. So my book is on um, universal cult holiness. The Ignatius Press book is it's called. Um, uh, a, a manifesto for evangelization, our moment of Christian witness, which is for for your viewers, Hans Urs von Balthasar wrote a very famous book called "The Moment of Christian Witness" mm-hmm. in English, "Quoted uh, oder Ernstfall" in Ernst, German. Ernstfall, yes, uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk Ernstfall, about that a little later. Yeah. You know, small little book, and what? But he's addressing the crisis of our time. So it, this is a sort of Got update. It. This is a, an update of Balthazar's, you know, moment of Christian. Well, I have to say, I'm I'm enjoying your jumping right into the uh, the sort of the 
the silly little tempests in the teapot that 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 is sort of Catholic Twitter and Catholic social media of of really sort of doubling down on von Balthasar because I think his voice is an important one um, despite uh, all of the sort of the strange uh, anti von Balthasarian sentiment that that is. Uh, sadly, kind of floating around out there. So that's great news. I'm, I'm glad that you are going to do that. Um, I, I, you know, I yeah. think it's necessary. I, I really do. And I don't agree yeah. with everything. In well, Baltimore. you don't have I mean, to. That's, gosh, like, that's not the rule, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, just like Thomas, don't agree with everything Aquinas said. I don't agree with everything Can Balthazar said. Can you say that, says, Larry you know, Chap? So. Can you say that and still be <laughs> Aquinas a, was right, wrong and about still a few be things. a good Thomist Catholic? Yeah. Well, look, you know, I, I um, I've been I've been busy here at at the school, and and you know, I, I teach and I, I coach golf on the golf team. We just finished our season, wow. yeah, and um, finished third. Very exciting. Go Ravens! And um, anyway, so I've been. Just basically wall to wall, you know. I go to class from roughly seven thirty to roughly three thirty, and then I go to practice roughly three thirty to roughly five thirty. You know, grab some dinner, uh, you know, do the family thing in the evenings, and then to bed and do it all over again. So I really haven't had a lot of time to do anything um, that I've really sort of drawn to. And of course, one of those things is is really talking with you uh, about uh, all things. And so fortunately, you've been busy uh, yeah. on Gaudium at Spes twenty two. Um, your your blog, and in fact, I you know what what finally you know I, there there were two articles that you've done that I really wanted to talk about, but we're going to go in reverse order. I'd like to start off today talking about your piece uh, you posted on November six, the bourgeois church of spectators and the crisis of morale in the priesthood. Now, um, so we're just a few days, about a week um, out from you having posted that. And before we get into it, what kind of um, feedback have you gotten from the piece and what do you make of it? Well, it's very, very interesting. It's one of the most popular pieces I've ever wow. written. According to WordPress's uh, mm -hmm. statistics, it's just sort of off the charts. But beyond mm -hmm. that, I've gotten, uh, oh God, so many private mm -hmm. emails and, and, and Facebook messages from wow. priests uh, from a lot of priests who wrote to me and said, spot wow. on, you are absolutely correct. What you write about here is our experience. So thank you yeah. for doing this. So I've got a, a lot of very strong, positive feedback. Some, um, the only time I get a lot of negative feedback is, is when I, you know, do my trashing of like the rad trads then then i get a lot of negative feedback and maybe sometimes i deserve it but because i can be a real yep. snot and <laughs> well i mean like you, <laughs> you know, know I mean, I, they're pretty good at it too so i, I you know well yeah you know and we, we yeah. give and we take yeah. but uh nevertheless the, the the response has been very positive and and you know especially since what provoked me to write this as i say at the very, very beginning yeah, it's a, of this it's a piece, personal thing for you it's very yeah. personal it was a very rough yeah. week for me yeah. last week because a man that i went to seminary with and he was probably one of my three or four closest friends wow. in the seminary um i'm not going to okay. mention his name because he might turn out to yeah. be innocent and so i don't want to you know falsely smear a man's name if he does turn out mm -hmm. to be innocent but he was arrested he, he's, he is a priest of the you know the fraternity of saint peter uh priestly fssp so he's a traditional latin mass priest and and so that sort of adds to the it, to the it, punch yeah. in the gut for a lot of people here because this is a this is someone who was very high up in the fssp right. at one time and is very revered by many people in the traditionalist movement. I considered him a very close and, and dear friend for many years. And he was arrested last week for apparently the possession and the sharing of child right. pornography. Now, there's always the off chance that somebody, you know, else was using his computer. It's uh, that his computer it's was pretty hacked. sophisticated um, uh, from what I can from what I can gather. These these sort of sting operations are, are pretty sophisticated. You know, they are. You know, so for example, they when they when they analyze your computer and they see that you've downloaded child porn at three a.m. twenty five right. nights in a row, it's kind of hard to believe that somebody in the rectory broke into your right. your office at right. three a.m. ten nights in a row. So that kind of thing, or if it was downloaded on your on your iPhone at a Starbucks ten or eleven times, it's you know. Yeah. So yeah, but I'm still holding out hope. Yeah, prayer. Of that he's innocent, but I would ask all of your viewers, at the very least, uh, 
my friend, notwithstanding, it does highlight who really should be prayed for here, which are yeah. the children who are depicted in these hideous, demonic, disgusting mm. videos, because many of them are of trafficked, yeah. and many of them are harmed. Some of them are murdered. It is a horrific, horrific crime to download child pornography. And so as much as it pains me, if my friend is guilty of this, what, what, what it provoked in me was a sense of how could a man who I think is a good man, I, I, I don't think I could have been that wrong about him all these, but what is it about the modern church that takes a, a, an otherwise good man and turns him into someone who, I, I, I hesitate to say moral monster or beast, but somebody well, possessed. who becomes possessed, complete, uh, Larry, this is almost really what we're possessed. Talking about here. I think that because I think this represents a satanic attack on the priesthood. Many people have pointed this out. Many priests who have emailed me said that they feel under demonic mm. attack themselves quite frequently. It's almost as if Satan has truly unleashed on the modern church a very specialized laser-like sort of attack on the priesthood and uh, one of the chief ways he's doing it is through internet pornography and you know as you point out at the beginning of your piece you know you call it uh, you know the rolling nightmare um that we we faithful laity and faithful priests are, are watching and witnessing unfold and 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 I, I, I kind of want to just sort of sim, you know, talk on that just a little bit, just chew on that. The, the fact that this has been a, a rollout that now is basically encompassing my entire adult life. Mine too. Well, m yeah. the latter part of my entire adult life. Let, let, yeah. let me go back and say, all right, let's let's do this because it is I, a I rolling nightmare, important. and this is on people's minds. So let's let's let let's let's dig into this. When I was in the seminary, as I say in the piece, all right, I, I, I my friends and I would look around at some of the guys that were getting ordained. We would say to ourselves, we wouldn't trust that person to yeah. wash our cars, let alone run a parish. And yet, because of the vocations crisis and the shortage, and I think this is what fueled bishops were extremely reluctant not to ordain a warm yeah. body and therefore seminaries were extremely reluctant to kick right. guys out because they didn't want to anger the bishops who would then pull their other men out of the seminary and the seminary well, would go under so the, the, it all begins in a sense with the vocations crisis with a few numbers so they have to become less selective and then all of a sudden the completely dysfunctional types creep in and, and i and i and we would see them but at the time way back when in my immature brain, this was late 70s, early early 80s, I had a scenario that so many people have, maybe you two shared this scenario in your head, that it's, also, that it's a simple matter of uh, good guys oh. versus bad guys, that all of this is a stuff created by Correct. liberal Catholics. Yeah, this, is a, this is such a deeply embedded meme in, in faithful Catholic circles, whether that is a sort of roughly conservative Catholic circle, a roughly liberal circle. Right. Uh, even or roughly trad circle like this meme really and it's particularly pernicious with trad and conservatives right that that you think well oh, you know yeah. father likes the rosary so you know he's somehow uh, beyond uh, suspicion and and I don't know how yeah. how can this thing continue to persist Larry well it it, it will persist I think so long as I mean this well, I mean this so bad heuristic right you know that's really what I'm talking about Oh, the batterist. Well, okay, yeah. Well, I think it's dying. Jeez. Uh, I, I, you know, you, you know a lot of traditionalist yeah. friends, maybe more than I know. But among my traditionalist friends, especially like with the arrest mm -hmm. of my friend who was yeah. in the FSSP and stuff. But you know, we've seen revelations come out about the SSPX yeah. uh, and things in there. I think more and more and more traditionalists are beginning to understand this is a problem in our household as well. This is not a liberal versus conservative thing. Now, that being said, I think it is true that liberal Catholicism in the 60s and 70s helped to create a sort of morally lax atmosphere in which some of this stuff could take place. Yes. I mean, there's a, there's a reason why these cases really started to rise in the 60s and hit a crescendo in the 70s and the 80s. And even though they're still around, they're not nearly as prevalent as they were in the 70s and the 80s. So you have to look at what was going on from 1965 Correct. to 1980. Correct. 
okay? And what was going on was a crisis of identity in the priesthood more than anything, created by all of this confusion in the church, created by all of the, you know, the silly season, as George Weigel calls it, and liberal Catholicism. So, yes, conservative Catholics are just as prone, conservative priests are just as prone to these sexual sins as liberals are, but I also think that they're being forced to swim in a church that created an atmosphere that, that did not support them yeah, properly. It's, and again, I think this is, maybe, I, I think this is a, an idea worth really kind of opening up a little bit because it can be confusing. So, for instance, the other day, uh, our, our, uh, our fine Cardinal Casper was tweeting out uh, about the, the German synodal way and was talking about how we're, you know, we need to be, you know, I don't know, Pop, basically, we need to be popular, right? And and if you look at what the German synodal way is attempting to do, I mean, they had to basically pull the plug early on this first wave because uh, the German synodal church was basically saying, "Let's get rid of the priesthood," um, which yes, which yes. which is oh, you know, yeah. I in, in a weird sort of way, I welcome the 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 bald. Uh, 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 brazen quality of that because I have always suspected just me, Kale, personally that that, that has a, a lot of what has been about a lot of what the sort of the, the, the neo-modernist church post, post-council post has been about has been the attempt to uh, destroy uh, the actual uh, uh, function and sacredness of a holy priesthood. Yes, uh, and and you remove those sorts. Uh, it, it, it can be quite artificial, yes, and external, but you remove some of those external supports and props that the church used to have for mm-hmm. the priesthood. You remove those utterly, and then you actually, as a church, as you know, a whole national church in Germany, start talking about we don't even need priests. Let's get rid of the priests. Let's just have this floating ministry like the Lutherans right. have. Right. All right, where you're called yep. and your bishop yep. appoints you, but you could you could quit and open a deli the next week, and it's right. no big deal. All right, and this weighs on yeah. you, and it undercuts the ascetical discipline that you need. Let's let's face it. There's a fine line between having a strong vocational identity and simply role playing, and this is kind of one of the things I'm getting at in my last blog. Yes, well, let's go there. Well. well, let's get into this role playing business because it's it's not that simple. I think. So please go ahead. I want you to lay it out because I want I have some questions to ask you about this whole role playing idea. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's not the sole barometer yeah. of how we have yeah, to yeah. analyze this. But one of the things that that's that strikes me and, and, one of the problems with writing a blog is that you try yeah. to cram so much yeah. into, and this blog was long yeah. as it was, but I've just been recently reading Marshall McLuhan and people like this and it's just very much on my mind that human consciousness has changed in the digital age. And we now, in a sense, have become a, a culture of watchers, a, 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 a culture of voyeurs, a culture of passive um, virtual reality uh, experiencers rather than experiences of reality. And I'm not the first person to notice this, nor Marshall yeah. McLuhan. And I think this affects the priesthood as well and the church as a whole well, as well. Well, well anyway, I think, go ahead. okay, so I want to, I want to, maybe twist that around a little bit. I would say that we've always been watchers insofar as we participate in story and narrative and drama and all of those things. What I think we are no longer, I think what the digital age has birthed is that there, that we are no longer actors in the flesh. Uh, if it, so, so yes. this is a, a, something I've been thinking about. I, I was rereading a, a chapter uh, in this book, actually, uh, Lewis Mumford's, uh, oh, it's backwards. Sorry. Uh, the City in History. And he has an amazing chapter on the medieval city and the the miracle of the medieval city. And in the medieval city, you have this kind of leveled existence. Uh, you know, you still have basic social hierarchies, but the, the social hierarchies are fundamentally participatory so that in the medieval procession, you become both participant and watcher in this cosmic drama. And he has this beautiful image of a Eucharistic procession, a Corpus Christi procession, as it wends and winds its way through the city into uh, the center, right, where where the cathedral and and the city government structure, you know, reside. And in this moment, as a a member of the polis, as a member of of the city, you are both watcher 
and participant. And, and, and I fear exactly. that we have lost the sense of divine participation. I think that's it. And, it, and it, it, it goes to one of the central motifs that I blog about so often, which is that there is this de facto atheism, de facto yes. practical yeah. agnosticism at the heart of the modern church. And how could it not? My point is that our, every cultural era is characterized by certain modalities. And our era is an era of unbelief, an era yes. of secularism, an era of reductionistic mm -hmm. naturalism that cannot help but rub off so when, on us. Can, 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 and, can and you so, trace that for me? Can you, do you have sort of a rough birth date or, you know, what, what are you thinking there? Well, I, I think a lot of it has to, it really has to be tied to the sort of uh, turn to the empirical that we saw in the scientific revolution, which of course had its antecedent so birthing in nominalism Day, and things Descartes, like that. Kant, but, I mean, what, but what are you thinking? Oh yeah, yeah. I think you know more than anything. Luther? I think the seminal, the, yes, the seminal catastrophic event of of European history over the past and, and, thousand and, years is and the, and therefore is the world, Prot right, Protestant and therefore world history. Yeah, and world history is the Protestant yeah. Reformation. Is the well, okay, so I'm going to push back that, a little bit. Okay, so why, why first? Yeah. Um, why do you think? Why do you think that? Because it destroyed a worldview. It destroyed the cohesion between that worldview and the culture that mm -hmm. it spawned. You were just talking about, you know, we were watchers, but it was a participatory, relational watching, wherein we entered into the rituals in order to engage in divine mm -hmm. participation. So we're, we're watchers, yeah, but in a relational way. But, and that has to be reinforced culturally, okay? It is, it, it, it is a cultural manifestation. Uh, there was a recent great article, I remember where it was sort of in defense of cultural right. Catholicism. And, and, and there's, there is something, there, there's to, something that, yeah. to this, but, but the, with the Protestant Reformation, this, this is rent yeah. asunder. And, and a, a, a lot of it has to do with a false theologizing about the nature of divine transcendence. The more and more and more God is sort of removed from the world in, in Protestant theology, the more and more and more this world becomes bleached of the divine presence. And into that rush comes modern science with its empiricism, its reductionism, its materialism, its nat. And then you get, of course, you, then you get Darwin, Freud, Marx, Nietzsche, all the masters of right. suspicion right. in the modern world. And then the entire, I'm writing yeah, about good. this right good. now in one of my books. So, you know, so the entire edifice of the modern world is predicated on the, on the proposition that we can construct a society as if God doesn't exist, that right. God as a construct is completely unimportant to our social organization. I don't want to sound like a rabid integralist, but the integralists are not right. entirely right. wrong here. Okay, and so this this is my point about the spectator church and how it affects Good. the priesthood yeah. to Good. bring it back Good. full circle, which is which is that obviously you are correct that we are in a sense, but what I like to do is to make a distinction between those different kinds of watching, which you just nicely did for me. Every Christian, as Balthazar points out, doesn't really reach full spiritual personhood until they understand their mission, right. their vocation from God. And therein, is, is something that we, there is where we watch because we, we, we read the lives of the mm -hmm. saints. We participate and watch the liturgy. And all of this helps to inform our own narrative. We mesh our narrative with those narratives in order to forge a Christian identity and mission, and then we act on it. Right. But that's different than the kind of role-playing past passivity that you get from simply sort of sitting back in a kind of neutralist mm -hmm. posture really that lacks belief. So as I said, it's a kind of Pascalian wager sort of thing, mm -hmm. or sort of he bet hedging sort of thing where, okay, I do believe something. At least I hope that right. this is true, but I don't feel it in my heart. So I'm just going to go through the motions. You know, I'm going to act as if I'm a priest. I'm going to act as if I'm actually believing in the Eucharist as mm -hmm. I'm praying this. But maybe I really don't. And, and I would submit to you, and, this, and, and a lot of priests have written to me to say this, they think this is a very prevalent attitude. Uh, it would be, it's surprising the number of especially middle-aged to older priests who don't believe in the real presence wow. of Christ wow. in the Eucharist. You know, and so that, that underscores, well, then what's your identity? Who the heck are you? What are you doing? If you don't believe, well, where it's just a fellowship meal, 
you know, Jesus magically coagulates in our hearts out of our common love for one another. You know, it's very, it's a very Lutheran theology uh, to the extent that there is a real presence there. In other words, there's, there's a real crisis of morale rooted in a crisis of faith, which then spills over into a kind of, a kind of spectator priesthood where I sort of am watching myself watching where where i'm i'm going through the motions and um i have several priest friends who have, have said that this that, that they know for a fact from talking with fellow priests how many of their fellow priests actually have fallen into despair the despair of disbelief okay um well that that's a big deal uh well yeah the unbelief of the leaders well and i mean as much as that hurts to hear um, and I, I think we should sit with that, that because that's a that's that's bad <laughs> to put it put it simply. It's bad, uh, but but yeah. As much as that hurts to hear, I have to say, on some level, it's satisfying to a watcher of the scene like myself because I sit back and I watch and I wonder and and I and I and I'm just sort of struck by these guys don't seem like they believe in anything and so yeah maybe that's maybe maybe my hunch maybe my intuitive sense has actually picked up on something that is real your 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 zelda yeah, well, yeah. sense has well, kicked I, in know. yeah yeah well you know i have a very good priest friend i went to seminary with him he's now a priest good priest great priest he, he says uh, he's not a traditionalist priest but he says the yeah. tlm mass uh, for the, for that community out of a, out of a pastoral yeah. concern, but he he said to me once, Larry, over the phone, to be honest with you, I'm not certain anybody believes anything anymore, and and what he meant by that isn't I mean come on well let's not be judgmental here I'm not I'm not throwing out accusations here of rampant atheism in the ranks of the laity and the priesthood as if I'm some sort of God given sure. gift to the church. <laughs> But in other words, but it's something that spiritual writers write about all the time. I'm not saying anything new. And it's something that's been in the church for a very long time. But as you said, I think at the very beginning, I think it's something that's worse now. So it, it's a sin that's always been with the church, a danger that's always been with the church, a kind of empty form with the church, a danger that's always been with the church, a kind of empty form, uh, a boredom with the faith, all these things, which is now on yes. steroids. Because modern modern culture rushes in and reinforces all of that, and the church herself is in great confusion and turmoil. Has you know, which if I'm gonna if I'm gonna steal man Luther here for a minute, which you know, I, I am not a Catholic triumphalist. I have I have learned my lesson um, with that. It, it, certainly, vis-a-vis yes. -vis our current situation and our and our current regime that we are uh, toiling under. So I'm not a triumphalist. Uh, I, I have deep, deep, deep problems with Luther, of course, um, because I agree with you that that what he birthed uh, was disaster in, in in almost every way. Uh, can yeah. I can I interrupt yeah. for one second? Because yeah. I think this will support what you're about to say. Luther did not birth the Protestant Thank Reformation. Okay. The that, Catholic that, Church you, did. You you anticipated so, my yeah. point because you know Luther is the Church's fault, pure and simple. There's no yes. You cannot. You Absolutely. cannot um, look into the history with any kind of fairness and, and depth or sophistication and come away with any other thing than we act up royally. Oh, we sure did. And if there hadn't been also at the same time such a heresy oh, hunting mentality yeah. in the church at that time. Which, I mean, which, uh, which is Luther a response, right? Which is a response to the birth of modernism, right? Ne uh, you know. Early modernism. It's oh, a, yeah. The, the church. Early, mo uh, wait, early I mean, modernism. I've got to get this out because it's been something that's been burning me no, out. No, go it's ahead. A, every time the church acts high-handed and in heavy fashion, it is doing so from a place of fear and weakness. Every time. Yeah, absolutely. I would recommend to your viewers a book by a theologian and a historian, oh. Brad Gregory, called The Unintended Great. Reformation. And and what he says in there essentially is that the medieval church had all the pieces together to really do something special, uh, and and there but the church failed. Why did that medieval church, which was doing so well in so many ways, the church sure. at the apex, the zenith of, of its life, why did it fail? Because the church lacked charity. Wow. 
the church can you, can you, un, can you for our, our it, viewers and listeners can you un, unravel that a little bit for us or lay it out for us a little bit well what do you mean it, by it, that it, yeah it became it, it became a church preoccupied with its own wealth, right. its own land, its own status, its own power, poli- right. political power. And therefore, all of these things became very important to them and to hang on to them. And then that then requires a measure then of thought control. Right, right. Okay, I've, I've been thinking a lot about so this. You, that the, the move from, from, from the, the practice of the faith to the sort of the thinking of the faith. And, and you and I are both intellectual people. It's not that I think that intellectualism itself yeah, or yeah. thinking is bad, but rather it becomes like, what do you, like, what can you put on paper? What, what can you put on a piece of paper with check marks to say that you believe versus living out the faith, doubt and all? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and and, and the th- that that mentality, like you said, is, it comes from mm-hmm. fear and weakness and a desire to control completely eliminates what you were just talking about, this need to, in a sense, uh, in, in a proper phenomenology of how yes, people yes, actually yes, have faith, yes. you know, you know, to actually, so to go back to Luther, you know, what if after he's all hot and bothered and he posts his 95 theses, uh, the local Catholic bishops in league with the Pope say, hey, Martin, uh, you got yeah. some good points there. We all, but we think you're kind of off on a few others. Why don't you? Why don't we all just sort of sit down and maybe we'll have a little local yeah. synod, and we'll we'll talk about your ideas and hammer them out, and maybe we can, you know, actually incorporate some of these things that you're saying, uh, because actually we did later on incorporate right. some of the things right. that Luther was saying. Right? Of course, a lot of what he was said we yeah. had to reject, but Luther was also a very passionate, emotional man. Right. So you know. If, if if he could have at least been met with charity from the church instead of you are anathematized and, you know, maybe just, and I'm not engaging in Pollyanna no, no. revisionism here. Maybe Luther was, who knows? But the fact remains that the path of reconciliation was not followed. Right. At and, all. And, and it led it led to the hardening of divisions in an era where. Uh, religion and politics were still so closely intertwined that once once the Protestant revolt got ensconced in, in the principalities of the Germanic nobility and so on, then it becomes then it becomes then it's its own movement towards wealth and yeah. aristocracy. In other words, there were vested economic interests in Luther. Oh, absolutely. Away from the, 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 the perverse incentives were, were all laid bare and, and, and acted upon, which is, you know, should surprise no one. Um, look, I, I think in like my politics, I'm ultimately Dantean. You know, I, I believe in the symbolic and I, I believe in the symbolic importance of Rome. Um, I'm a Roman Catholic after all, but I also believe that the church functioning in, in its proper way is a guard against the excesses of the city of man. And I feel like if you look back on, on the history of things, all too often, I mean, look, Dante would have been um, shamed magic, you know, royally uh, for his, his, his takes on Twitter by, you know, our current, you know, uh, Catholic, uh, you know, integralist folks, right? You know, how dare Dante talk poorly yeah, about yeah, the Pope? How yeah. dare he put Boniface the Eighth? in the uh, seventh circle, or sorry, the fourth <laughs> circle of hell, I think it is. You know, how dare he? And it's like, well, yeah. because he needs to be, right? You know, in other words, the, the, because he's using yeah. the church, you know, he's he's using the church uh, for what you would say um, penultimate um, uh, penultimate ends, right? And, and the church, in order to, to properly function, must never lose sight of those, uh, the, the, the ultimate goods. Well, yeah, you see, this is my constant uh, hobby horse in my blogging, which is the the compromise and accommodation the modern church has made with, with right. modern bourgeois culture. Now, bourgeois, I, tr- I quote Tracy Rowland in the piece, bourgeois is not simply, uh, you know, middle class. Very important. I, I, want middle, to, I want you to tease this out for us here on, on, on camera, because I, I think that when people hear bourgeois, I, yeah. I'm not sure if they're hearing uh, us correctly here. Yeah, it's very important to understand that the, the term, the, that's why you quote it in <laughs> French and you say bourgeois. And, and you, oh, I don't want to sound like Kamala Harris with a fake mm-hmm. French accent, but you, 
Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the plan. But anyway, uh, bourgeois. Uh, the reason why you use it in French is because as a term, it, it connotes a little more than simply what it denotes. I could just say in English, a church that's made its accommodation to the middle class. Right. And that would not have the same yeah, effect right. because there's nothing wrong with I'm middle class. There's nothing wrong with being middle class. It's better than being poor, I'll tell you that. And being rich, according to the gospel, has its own its own dangers. Right, so right. maybe middle class is the way to go. But what bourgeois means uh, is is an entire mindset in the modern world, and this is what sort of what the French term conjures up, in which the be all and end all of our life is this world, and and the point to our existence is material well being and comfort and security, and the role of government is to secure that material well being, that comfort, that security, and so what it what you end up with then the bourgeois mind, the bourgeois spirit is a mind that's simply obsessed with the penultimate goods of this world, and then loses sight of how all of that is grounded in moored in the ultimate reality that that is God. God becomes an add-on. God yeah. becomes sprinkles yeah. on the ice cream, gravy on the potatoes, uh, something that you can enjoy and you'll go to church and all that, but it doesn't seek deeply into the culture because the culture is about penultimate values of material and worldly comfort. Now, that can become cliched. It can become a, a, a manichae and dualism and you don't want. That's why I refer to it as, in a sense, it's it's a it's a displaced hierarchy of penultimate goods right. versus ultimate goods. I'm not saying the enjoyments of this of world are bad. Right. I mean, I like cigars and bourbon and, you know, as right. much as the next, and fine restaurants. I'm not saying that enjoying the good, that, that would be Manichaean. That would be a false dualism that has infected large segments of the church for, for a long time. But it is nevertheless true. And all the saints and mystics and popes have said this. All right, so you can go back to St. Paul. If you fixate on the penultimate goods, then you be, then you eventually descend in what right. Paul called Yeah, good. Right, we need to talk a little bit about this flesh. because I ran into this in class the other day. One of my smart students said, you know, our, you know, Mr. Zeldin, you know, uh, if Paul is sort of talking about, you know, the flesh against the spirit and, um, you know, Augustine uh, is a Manichaean but then sort of works his way out of that, you know, what, what, th- there seems to be some sort of um, – contradiction uh, at the heart of the incarnation. And so it was interesting trying to kind of tease this out with her. So, you know, I think it's worth just a, a couple of minutes. Oh, yeah. It's, well, well, yeah. I mean, obviously. Oh, yeah. It's, well, well, yeah. I mean, obviously, right. uh, I mean, you could use different words in Greek for the word body. There's soma. Yeah. You know, is a word that you could use for body. And it's a more general. Whereas sarx is a very concrete term. It means uh, more abstract, sinew, flesh, bone. Sarx. That's, mm-hmm. sort of, uh, mm-hmm. that's why when, in John's Gospel, when he says, you know, the word became flesh, it's kaiha logos sarx againato. All right, so nothing bad. It just means flesh, bone, sinew. But what St. Paul is therefore saying, he's making that distinction between mm-hmm. a, a Christian who has mm-hmm. a pneumatic mind, who has put on the mind of Christ, who then orients his sarx towards the love of God, that's fine. That, then you're dealing with right, what because Christians otherwise, should be doing, right, and otherwise, you can enjoy it, the goods the, of the this flesh, world. The flesh, then, is, is, right? it, is just itself. Um, it, it, it becomes a penultimate disordered good. Yeah, because as, as Pope Benedict says in his book, in his book, his encyclical Deus Caritas yeah. Est, for example, eros is great. You know, erotic love is great. All those sort of passions are great. But unless it finds a culmination and an fulfillment in, in agape, sa- sacrificing love, then what happens is that eros right, degenerates right, right, into something right. that isn't even properly right. eros right. anymore. Or like the, like the right. sex addict who doesn't want to have love with his sex, yeah. he just wants sort of that kind of orgasmic yeah. pleasure over and over. After a while, that's no fun anymore. After a while, he le- loses even the erotic dimension. Likewise, with all the elements of our flesh, St. Paul right, saw this. Right. Saint, this is what St. Augustine meant by the libido dominandi. Because, we, yes, we're redeemed, but we are fallen creatures. Yeah. And as I often say in my blogs, we are either ascending upward towards God or we're That's descending right. downwards towards our gut or our crotch or our veins. Okay? And, and this is what Paul is talking about. And this is the distinction. There's no stasis in the spiritual life. And unless you orient your sarks upward, 
Now, you'll fail over and over and over. That's not the point. But it, unless your fundamental orientation right, is because, upward, because then you the will Sarks be dragged to the bottom and, of the and pool. And look, the, the, the horrors and the outrage and the, and the, the yes. tears that Dante suffers in Inferno in particular um, are because he's seeing uh, the icon of, of God himself, you know, the, the, the Imago Dei. We are made the image and likeness of God. He sees the twisted results of our disordered love. Uh, and what it does to the sarks, right? So you've got these twisted bodies, these ripped open bodies, these these pustuled bodies, right? And and, and, and the outrage yeah, for Dante, yeah. the, the 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 deep lament and sadness, and then eventually ang- righteous anger, is that we have used our bodies for penultimate goods, penultimate realities. Instead of the body being an icon for God Himself, it has become a, a, ter- a tawdry plaything well yeah. yeah you oh my god i love that you should write a guest blog for me on my all post right, on all that on all what you just said write that down boy and send it to me because uh, because because the deal is uh that this is exactly why saint paul, when paul is talking about why we should avoid sexual immorality he doesn't say well because it perverts Fine, the sexual right, right. faculty and it's against natural law that's right. all true right but what he says your body is a temple of the so, holy so, okay. spirit so so, so, so don't so you understand that right. You know, what, so that's then, what he says. You know, Don't play you this get game, your body like, what is a temple of God? Yeah. You know, a temple is is a, is an articulation of a space set aside in which to house the divinity, right? That's and, and so therefore it becomes this gathering yes. point, this locus in which we participate in the presence of the divine, making then us participants and um, uh, embodiers of the divine, and so. That's what our bodies are, right? And that's what we're for. We are made and ordered for worship, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, when I was in seminary, I had a professor. Mm-hmm. He was from County Kerry in Ireland. And he always liked to quote one of the fathers. I'm not sure which one it is who said that every time we receive the wow. Eucharist, wow. we are being embalmed for the resurrection. And and I that has always stuck with me because what yeah. it, what it not only underscores is Eucharistic realism, the, but and it and, and in a sense don't take people don't yeah. take this the wrong way, but the, yeah. the sort of the real physicality of, of, of the Eucharist, the real body of Christ, and that it is literally theosis. becoming theosis. one with my body, uh, in, in in yeah it's theosis it is theosis. And this is such a neglected aspect of our spiritual life, which is why Paul, Augustine are saying, right. they're not saying bodiliness is bad. Th- quite that's to the right. Contrary. And, and what God. they're saying is, yeah. you don't know yeah, what your yeah, bodies yeah. are for. Here's what they're for. And you're not using them properly. And because you're not using them properly, right. you're not actually Good. even really enjoying your body. Yeah. Now, to bring it back to my blog about the crisis in the priesthood, this is, this is kind of the point I'm making about the modern church. In, in, in making its accommodation, hey. the point I'm making about the modern church, in, in, in making its accommodation with with the cul-de-sac, as I call it, the accommodation with you know the modern spirit of of the of bourgeois penultimate goods are the ultimate goods. Mm-hmm. The church, in a sense, ultimately loses something precious. Ultimate goods are the ultimate mm-hmm. goods. The church, all of a sudden, you begin to notice. That things are in terms right. of her, in terms of her, to the right. Why are we listening to the left? What's going on? <laughs> and and all of sinking, and you don't, and we and we need a strap uh, sinking, and you don't run here, uh, and everybody's in a pan, and we and we need a strap here, uh, yeah, and yeah, everybody's yeah, right. in a pan. We need strategy, and we need a new mm-hmm. change in canon law, and it's mm-hmm. it's this strategy, and we need a new change in canon no. law, and it's it's this yes, Mary Priest. Or, no, what you need is a revolution. Of most priests who have written to me have said it's the crushing in Mary Priester. No. Yeah. What you need is a revolution of, of so many people that they've gotten some what differentism. Uh, I feel it in myself. I mean, this is our, you know, and I'm not here to condemn. I, in, I mean, culture, our culture gives us this indifferent. I mean, how many people go to mass and they want it to be short because really they just want to sort of feel good about themselves for having gone to church and then they get yeah, communion it's, it's and out the door we thing. go, but it so, hasn't moved. 
Right. So to this end, I, I'm, I'm going to read, read to you, you. Uh, I, I love this. You say, lacking a real faith. This is from the blog post that's linked just below here in the show notes. Lacking a real faith in the transformative power of grace, the church has nothing left but role playing at Christianity. With all the outward trappings of its totems of spirituality still in place, but now pressed into service as a mere as mere props for its sacramental kabuki theater stage show. And like all good stage actors, it has an inner eye for observing itself precise, precisely as acting, self-consciously aware of itself as an imitator of realities it no longer embodies. And when I read that uh, the other day, I don't know if you recall, there's this hilarious... Uh, in the 80s uh, SNL skit, it was a John Lovitz skit, and he it was called Master Thespian yes. Theater, and, and he was just sort of this acting, acting yes. brilliant, and you know, and, and and it was just super hammy, super you know, um, uh, what, uh, what's what's the Shakespearean actor from London in the mid century? Uh, uh, Oh gosh, Lawrence Olivier, Lawrence very Olivier, yeah. hammy and just like for my taste, just not my taste, you know. But acting brilliant, and and you do get that, right? I mean, in, in yes. my dark moments, when I when I watch, right, uh, and I'm trying to participate yes. in that Ratzingerian sense of of our liturgies, you know, you just sort of get the impression that for so many folks, and this cuts straight across ideologies and and uh, 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 theologies. You know, it's you just wondered, did, is that all it is? 